Hello, lovely viewers. My name is Sally Delisle, and I am here today to chat with Megan Morris. So Hi. you previously watched any of these interviews, you may have noticed that she was doing the interviewing <laughs> with a few of our incredible yoga and mindfulness instructors. And so today, it is my turn to interview her. <laughs> the previous interviews can be found on our Child Light Education Company YouTube channel. Uh, but today it is her turn to share. So good morning, Megan. Good morning, Sally. If you don't know this already, Megan wears so many hats. And when I think about her, that book caps caps for sale comes to mind <laughs> one of my favorites she is a wife a mom to two amazing children she is author of a children's book the amazing om yes mm -hmm. yep uh, she teaches weekly prenatal, baby, toddler, and gentle yoga classes. Um, she also teaches teacher trainings for all of those topics. And she is the co-owner and director of marketing for Child Light Education Company. Her newest teacher training offering is a new training that she is currently writing and launching next month on the topic of gentle yoga for seniors. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So Megan, first, tell us all about your yoga journey and what brought you to Child Light. Yeah, so that's a long story. I'm gonna try and tell it fast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I was a theater major in college and the first year out, I was an, uh, an acting intern at a professional theater company, Bloomsburg Theater Ensemble. And one of the weekly requirements for interns was yoga. In my very first class, I was hooked. I was like, I'm going to have to learn how to teach this to other people because it's so incredible. And I never thought I would be a teacher of anything because, you know, back then I really perceived myself as an impatient person. Uh, but I just knew that this was something that I was going to have to make a big part of my life. So I studied, I took so many trainings and I was taking like two classes a day, you know, before I had children, I was really uh, devoted to the practice and still feel that I am. It's just evolved a lot. It's not so much the physical for me now as it is a lifestyle. And uh, after I had my first child, who's seven now, uh, I remember when he was almost about to turn one, uh, you and I went out for lunch <laughs> and I was, uh, I think I was like trying to sell Arbon at the time. And I was like, <laughs> oh my God, I'm about to tell you a secret, but I suck at this and I can't do it. <laughs> and I said, I just don't know what to do next. And you said, well, why don't you write the prenatal yoga training for child light? You've taken trainings, you teach it, you should do this. And I was very excited by that. And I spent six months writing that training and, uh, you know, creating the curriculum and started teaching it for Child Light. And then you said, do you want to do administrative work for Child Light? And I said, yes. You said, do you want to do marketing for Child Light? I said, yes. I just kept <laughs> saying yes. And, uh, and then, uh, oh, I also took the baby toddler training when my first was quite young as well. And that was such a great experience for both of us. Uh, and it really helped me figure out the next steps, it all kind of came together to teach prenatal yoga, baby yoga, toddler yoga. And then um, I still enjoy very much working with uh, my gentle yoga students too. Uh, but then eventually, uh, Lisa Flynn, the former uh, owner and founder of Child Light, asked if, if you and I wanted to buy the company together. And we said yes. And then four months later, we had a pandemic. And it's been a wild ride ever since. It so sure thank you. Has. 
<laughs> there are a lot of yeses in mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I'm really glad you answered yes. Me too. Quite a few times there. Every day. I'm mm -hmm. glad I did too. What does yoga mean to you, Megan? You know, I was, I have been asking this question to other people in these interviews and was surprised by the answers I got because they were, the answers were more like personal, you know, uh, how did yoga help other people through challenging times and then how it has helped sustain them through uh, new challenges. And that's what it can be uh, for, for so many of us. Uh, we, when we first learn about yoga, it's, it's a very personal practice. And, uh, but when I first thought about this question, I was like, well, what is the literal meaning of yoga? That's the way I thought about it. But, you know, people know that answer now. It's like to yoke union, to make whole, to bring together, to be one. And in the beginning for me, you know, it was like, how am I going to make my life more sustainable? How am I going to feel more at home in my body and love myself better? And it was very much like me, me, me. And then once I realized, you know, you can do all this work on yourself, but it really doesn't mean anything unless you go out and help others. And that's how it evolved for me. You know, at, at, I knew right away I wanted to share the practice in some way. And I started by teaching yoga to adults. And then I had my own children. I was kind of scared of children <laughs> until I had my own. <laughs> and then I was like, well, of course I should be sharing yoga with children because they're the future. If we're setting up a whole generation of people to have more tools to cope with life's challenges and be more mindful, then we're going to see a better future. It's a slow trickle. Um, but you know, that's, that really made sense to me, but then taking it a step further into service and seva, and that, that really becomes the whole purpose in my mind is we, we get right with ourselves so that we can go serve other people. And it, we do that in a variety of ways. You know, I, I did a lot of service work in my twenties and then having children, I've been in service to them for seven years. And, uh, and also, you know, the contributions to child life feel like service work to me in a lot of ways. So uh, that's, that's how it's evolved for me. Beautiful. Thank you. And running child light, keeping child light going, it's not always easy. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a beautiful thing that we have each other because mm -hmm when I'm having a challenging day, you lift me up and keep me going. When you're having a challenging day, I do the same for you. And we always go back to the mission statement and that we're here for the reason of service and to provide tools and skills to people out in the world. Um, that's the whole reason why we're doing what we're doing. Absolutely. Yep. And and it, it, this whole setup is more sustainable because we have each other. It's a partnership. I know so many business owners who are doing it by themselves. You know, it's, it's them at the top and then they, maybe they have some employees and team members that are um, contributing in different ways. But our team is so special. Mm -hmm. You know, there's just a lot of love and kindness and the principles of yoga shine through there and I'm I can't imagine anything better our team is incredible and they're yeah. out there doing the work and practicing they're not just talking right right yeah and B showed up in my inbox today being celebrated for another thing she did completely unrelated to child light I'm like oh my gosh this is amazing <laughs> it is amazing yeah so tell us a bit more about um, the classes that you teach, the trainings you offer, and you truly are tapping into the entire lifespan. And you've talked about it a little bit, but can you expand on that? Yeah. So, uh, you know, what? my very first teaching gig was a gentle yoga class on a Friday morning. 
uh, I was working the desk at that studio on Friday mornings until I took my teacher training. And then as soon as I finished up teacher training, the person who taught that gentle class was retiring and asked if I would take it over. So for, you know, since 2008, that's been a regular class on my schedule until the pandemic hit. And that was such an incredible learning experience for me at, you know, going into teaching at 23 and the majority of the students in the room were 65 plus coming in with ailments that, you know, I hadn't even thought about yet outside of the, the training that I had received. And I learned how to, to work with a, a variety of different bodies, a variety of different personalities. I saw the uh, power of community building in yoga, and that really set me on a path to, to, to do the most that I could with this practice in terms of teaching. So I, I really focused on gentle yoga for a while uh, after I felt like I had a lot to offer in that department, because the thing is, you know, there weren't any gentle yoga trainings around in 2008. I, I had a really hard time finding anybody who could specifically focus on that type of practice. So I felt like I was kind of creating my own rules as I went, like what's appropriate for the majority of the people in the room and starting there. And now there's a lot of different options out there. I'm really grateful that that has become more mainstream and that there are more trainings being offered uh, for that population. But in the meantime, I was creating curriculum to help other teachers. So, you know, I've been teaching a gentle yoga workshop for many years. And the people that have attended that keep saying to me, well, you could expand this. This could be more than a few hours or a day. Like there's so much that, you know, you can be offering. So now we have this 15 hour training, gentle yoga for seniors. Uh, however, I feel like it's applicable to a variety of age groups. It's not just uh, for um, people 65 plus, because uh, I, I like to practice in a gentle way. That's my preference for a physical practice as well. Um, so the, I'm kind of starting in the opposite direction. I also teach the prenatal yoga teacher training. So, uh, you know, we were doing this interview with the reporter the other day and she's like, when can people start practicing yoga? And I said, in the womb, <laughs> 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 you know, I mean, it's definitely for the, the uh, pregnant person, most of all, but, you know, babies start to hear us in the womb between 16 and 20 weeks. And they are, you know, picking up on the vibe of the space and the people in that pregnant person's presence. And so we're trying to create a, a nice place to be while you're in the womb. And then you're born. And at six weeks, you're welcome to come to a baby yoga class with your caregiver. And baby yoga has things in it that look like, that resemble what we know as a, a physical yoga practice for adults. But for the most part, baby yoga is about bonding. And it's like one of those few moments in the week where everyone puts their cell phone down and they're fully present with their child, which is really important. Uh, and then toddler yoga is a little bit more uh, high energy. I always say that baby yoga is the cutest class that I teach all week and toddler yoga is the most fun. Uh, when we've got a lot of kids in the room, it's chaotic magic. And uh, that is really, really awesome to, to be a part of. Now, now that my kids are getting older, I'm exploring, you know, teaching those age groups as well, but I really have come to know about myself that I really enjoy prenatal babies, toddlers, and gentle. It's really what I specialize in and teach the trainings in. Lovely. I, uh, when I mentor, coach, and teach other um, instructors, you just touched on a point that I share quite often is that when you learn one age range or you specialize in one age range, it doesn't mean that you need to stick with that um, topic or age group. It can certainly evolve. Mm -hmm. And when my kids were young, I taught that age group. 
And then as they got older, I became familiar with what they were interested in and, and how they learned. And so I started teaching that age range when they were teens and they both became athletes. Mm -hmm. Then I learned how to teach athletes and specifically runners and baseball players. And um, then I shared that with college athletes. And now that my kids are in their 20s, maybe someday I'll be a grandmom and I'll go back to teaching babies, yep. toddlers, preschoolers. <laughs> so it's very cyclical. It really is. And I, that's one of the things I love about the practice is that there's always new things to learn. You know, if you get kind of bored with what you're doing, there's always more things to, to learn and, and to teach eventually, you know, if you've taken a real interest in it and you become, uh, you know, skilled enough in it to share it with others, we should, that's like the motto, one of the mottos of child light, learn, grow, teach. That's the whole purpose. <laughs> yep. That's right. Thank you. So one thing people may not know about you, uh, that I have the deepest respect for is that your time management skills are top notch. <laughs> so how is it that you manage your time so well? And do you have any tips to share? Yeah. Uh, so I feel like my mom instilled efficiency in me. You know, she was probably the most impatient person I knew. <laughs> She, if her time was being wasted, you were not, you know, Teresa Ridge was not happy with you. Um, and I, I kind of started to uh, idolize that in a way, like she, she knew how she wanted to spend her time and she scheduled her time wisely so that she was always making the most of it. You know, like we spend money, we also spend time. And people are more mindful about how they spend their money usually, but not always as mindful about how they spend their time. And I feel that time is a really sacred thing. And it's all about how we're looking at it. You know, um, there's this person that I talk about all the time, who's like a time management guru, Laura Vanderkamp. She's, she's written a few books on this subject. And her big point is there's 168 hours in a day, or I'm sorry, 168 hours in a week. And, you know, if we spend eight hours a night sleeping, we still have many, many hours left. Even after you, you subtract eight hours of sleep a night, you subtract 40 hours a week of work, there's still essentially when you calculate it out, like 10 hours a day that you could spend however you want. And of course, maybe two to three of those hours need to go to household chores or you know house household management but there's still a lot of time left and whenever someone says to me oh I'm too busy to do that my first thought is well you're probably not too busy you're just not making it a priority because we make the things that we want to do a priority when I'm avoiding a big work project that's the soundtrack I tell myself like, oh, you're, you're too busy to do this. Just put it off. But then I'll spend the whole night writing an entire curriculum, like just go for it for four hours and get a project done because I'm excited about it and I want to do it. So I need to like follow the cues of my, of my, I need to follow my intuition a lot of the time and say like, well, is this worth my time? Is this something I really want to put on the schedule? Am I going to dread it uh, or am I, it, it, am I going to feel like I want to put this energy into this thing? And if the answer is no, I really, I have to think long and hard about whether or not it's worth it. Um, and because sometimes you do have to do things you don't want to do, right? Because you know, it'll be good for some purpose, but you, you need to be clear on what that is. And, uh, you know, for my schedule, I don't really look at it by the day anymore. I have to look at it by the week uh, because I do schedule a lot of things back to back in a day sometimes. Um, and I don't, I need to look at the days around that day because what will happen is I might schedule four out of the ordinary things on Monday, four out of the ordinary things on Wednesday. And then I see Tuesdays open and it's like, well, Monday and Wednesday are really full. So maybe you need to keep Tuesday a little bit more clear than you, um, than you want to. 
and you have to look to the next week. So I like to on Friday kind of like plan my whole next week and look at things like what can you let go of, what um, you know what should be rescheduled so that you're not burnt out or resentful moving into the week, but mm-hmm. feeling like you can tackle it from a place of patience, compassion, and love, which is the whole purpose of yoga. <laughs> So pre-planning ahead of time and looking at the big picture one week at a time. It yeah. Like. Yeah. And sometimes even by the month at this point, because, you know, we schedule a lot of uh, trainings and I have to make sure I'm really mindful of how I'm using my energy so that I'm not en- ending up being sick before a training or feeling too tired to do it. Uh there's it, it, my schedule feels so full all the time. And I think a lot of people look at it and think it's a little crazy, but uh, so I wouldn't recommend it to everybody, you know, like we all have different capacities for what we're able to handle at different times in our lives. And at this moment, I'm, I do feel like I'm handling a little bit more than I have in the past, but it's for right now it is, it does feel sustainable. Super. And <clears throat> For viewers that don't know this, Megan and I are almost 20 years apart in age. (laughs) And so we kind of chuckle about that sometimes, the energy that Megan has and the energy that I have. (laughs) It's a good balance. You have a lot of energy. And (laughs) she keeps me going. I keep her going. Um, yeah, and you're good at being like, "Hey, did you schedule too much today?" Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm like, "Oh, yes, <laughs> slow it down." <laughs> but your time management is impeccable and very impressive. And this is a really uh, great segue into uh, a question about self care, which you touched on a little bit there. Uh, we spend so much time in this line of work caring for others. Um, so what are some self-care practices that you build into your schedule? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I have like 10 habits that I try to hit every day, like healthy habits. And if I don't hit those very quickly, I will see uh, my health deteriorate in some way. It's usually my mental health first, or like, I just start to feel like just physically more heavier, uh, you know, bloated, but like also my mind starts to feel more foggy. I start to feel more disconnected from the person I want to be moment to moment. So I know I've got to hit those habits and, and it includes things like, you know, getting 10,000 steps a day, you know, which might just be, you know, making sure I get out for a 40 to 60 minute walk usually does it. Um, making sure that I'm drinking enough water, making sure that I'm getting enough sleep. These are daily things that need to happen uh, in order for my overall mental, physical health to thrive. And, you know, I feel like self-care and wellness are getting kind of a bad rap right now. You know, people in the community are saying like, well, things like yoga and other healing modalities are a luxury. Not everybody has the opportunity to do these things, but the reality is people just need exposure to simple practices that are going to help them deal with the challenging moments of life. Uh, my One of my non-negotiables is for three minutes a day, I have to do some kind of either physical yoga practice or a breathing practice or a meditation. And that sets me right, you know, and it usually ends up being more than three minutes, the just laying out my mat and saying, all right, I've got three minutes. So that's all I'm going to do. But usually I have more time than that. And it turns into five, 10, 15 minutes. And I feel so much better when I'm done, but you need to, I have to be kind of disciplined with myself. I have to set boundaries around things or otherwise I'm the type of person that can easily live in extremes, like all or nothing. But one of the yoga principles, brahmacharya, is moderation. So we can always go back to the principles and say, how can I use these principles to support my self-care? And uh, anybody can learn these things. Uh, It's helpful if you have a teacher who can lay it out in a way that's so the information is being passed down accurately. But ultimately, ultimately, it's about, you know, everything we do, we should be leading with kindness. 
not harming. We should be telling the truth. We shouldn't be stealing, living in moderation, not being possessive, being clean, being learning contentment from the inside, uh, not relying on the world to fulfill our happiness, relying on ourself to keep that consistent. That's self-care to me. Um, self-study is self-care to me. Surrendering what I can't control is self-care. And they're also all yogic principles. Uh, I also like floating and going for a massage <laughs> because I am privileged and can do those things. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that you take care of yourself. It's very important. I try. And I and right away, I know if I've stopped, I can't uh, deny that. Yeah. Yeah. And you and your husband, Chris, are really great at supporting each other at doing that too. Yes. We have a lot of conversations about, you know, how we can support each other in, in being at our best health wise. Um, and also being really, uh, honest with each other when we see that the other one is slipping and needs support and uh, improvement in certain areas, which I'm really grateful for. Yeah. Okay. So finally, this is our closing question that we asked on the previous interviews with Larissa and Anne. So I'm going to ask you as well. If you had $1 million to spend and you knew you could not fail, and you can't spend it on yourself, what would you do with that $1 million? I've been thinking about this question a little bit um, because honestly, to make the most of that million, I would need to invest some of it to create more money <laughs> because I am really good at spending money and I think I would make a great philanthropist. <laughs> Because I'm really good at identifying uh, nonprofits that use their funds ethically and, and use them well. And I would I want to contribute to so many different nonprofits that I see doing great work, but I need the money to do that. So I wouldn't just want to stop at a million dollars. I want to grow that so that I can can like make that a a life a, a life career down the road, maybe like supporting nonprofits that that need that support. And then the other thought is, um, you know, in 2010, with uh, Off the Mat Into the World, I went to Africa and helped to fund and build a birthing center. And there was a woman who walked three miles in labor to this un not totally finished birthing center to, to have some support with her labor. And uh, my dream is to go back there and maybe be involved in that center somehow down the road. I know that they rotate out directors and there, there's always a need for more funds and more birthing centers in that area. It's a really remote area of Uganda. And uh, if we could be getting more birth support to those places, uh, I would love to be able to fund that kind of project. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, excellent ideas. Thank Brilliant. you. <laughs> Well, Megan, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down and talk with me today. Thank you, Sally. I know how much you juggle and more than anyone, I am beyond grateful that you are my business partner. Thank you for thank you. everything that you do, all the important work that you do for Child Light, for our community, for the world. And if you're watching this and you have questions for Megan or anyone here at Child Light, please reach out. Megan's email is Megan, M-E-G-A-N at childlightyoga.com. And mine is Sally, S-A-L-L-Y at childlightyoga.com. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter as Child Light Education Company. Uh, also on YouTube, information on the 15 unique yoga and mindfulness teacher trainings that we offer can be found on our website childlighteducationcompany.com. We offer these trainings in person, live virtually, and self-paced online. Megan has several live trainings coming up very soon, so be sure to check that out if you're interested. Thank you so much for watching.